Welcome to the Sports Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Lure, and I'm thrilled to have a fellow YPO on the line here today, calling in from Boston. Good evening there in Boston, Patrick Sweeney. Marcus, how are you? It's so good to be here. No, it's awesome, and uh, it's interesting us comparing notes that you've been stuck there for four months, I've been stuck here for four months, haven't both seen our our families and our wives, so uh, there's some interesting uh, parallels already there, but uh, that's good that we have each other here for the next hour to share your interesting stories um, and and the adventures you've been on uh, in the true sense of the word. So let me just quickly uh, talk a bit about, tell you about our listeners a bit more about you, because uh, there are a couple of folks which have similar names out there, um, so we want to make sure everyone knows who you are. So Patrick is the man behind the book Fear is Fuel, you know, the uh, surprise power of... Uh, <laughs> surprising power. <laughs> the surprising power to find purpose, passion, and performance. Sorry about that. Um, Patrick is an adventurer, a accomplished entrepreneur um, with uh, several companies which you build and sold, uh, and a cancer survivor. So there is a, a host of interesting elements to it. Uh, which we will digging into, um, and of course there is a sporting history there as well. Um, so I'll let you talk us through that a bit um, to uh, to get the ball rolling here, please. Uh, well, Marcus, it's uh, it's a great honor to be here, and I think you know if we work backwards, I'm really thrilled. It's it's strange times, as you know, of course, and um, uh, I was thrilled that the book, uh, my first big book that I spent six years in the making, uh, researching with over 32 of the world's top neuroscientists, uh, hit number five on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. So yes. I think it's helping uh, yes. a lot of people understand what's going on in the in the brain and uh, and helping people during these times of uncertainty, not just to, to survive, but um, hearing some great stories about people who are thriving and taking advantage of the uh, of the time when other people are are slowing up or being scared. And I think you know, if you if you look back a little bit on my life, I, I tell everyone I was the the biggest wimp and and sissy growing up for a lot of reasons. You know, I got bullied. We moved around a lot. I had mm -hmm. an abusive grandfather, and uh, and then you know uh, I had a big life changing experience and went from diary of the wimpy kid to captain courageous almost overnight. But uh, we can get into that a little more if you want. But yeah, the, definitely. The good I news love that. I love that part of the story. I, I want to just make sure everybody realizes that um, because of of neuroplasticity and the ability to change your brain, you can you can reinvent yourself at any age. You can change your mind, literally the the cellular structure of your brain at any age. So that's what I'm most excited about sharing with people. And and I kind of wrote the book as a handbook to help people get the most out of life. Yeah. I love that. Um, and, and we'll definitely dig much deeper into this. But uh, tell me a bit about your Olympic athlete uh, part of your, you know, how you, I think that's part of how you got started as well. And um, clearly you were in rowing. That's, that's not quite such a wimpy sport. Uh, tell us a bit about that. <laughs> well, it's not a sport, Marcus, you do for money or for fame. Put it that way. <laughs> that's right. Yes, that's true. So. When I was in high school, I had started cross-country skiing, and I got quite good at it um, when the technique – I was, went to high school in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and a uh, small town called Keene, New Hampshire, and the technique was diagonal stride, which is like you know one of those Nordic track machines in the gym, and, uh, and I won the state championship, and I used to go to bed every night and pray that I'd win an Olympic gold medal in, wow. uh, in skiing, and then okay. uh, I went to – university to to ski basically i went to the the only division one ski school that i got into university of new hampshire right. and uh uh you know was training the first year and it was right about when the technique started to change and i'm six foot three and um which i forget in centimeters i think that's one uh 83 or something like that one six, 190 three. anyways yeah, yeah you're about 190 yeah yeah you're, uh, you're right up there <laughs> you're tall so the technique changed from uh, from that skating to diagonal stride. And long story short, I wasn't good enough to to be on a Division One ski team anymore, and I was devastated. Mm -hmm. And um, the athletic director said, "You should try rowing. There's a, a Division Two uh, club program here. It's not the level of the skiing, but you, you'd probably enjoy it, and you've got the build for it." 
Hmm. And lo and behold, I went out the first year and won a national championship in a in a four man boat that I you know I stroked and then really just started a, a long time love affair with rowing and spent six years training full time. You know, I had a, a a lot of up and down through uh, school and after school because my my parents really, I was the first kid in my family to go to uh, college, go to university. And my parents really wanted me to get a job and get married and, you know, have a real life, as they said it. And uh, <laughs> right. I was making $25,000 a year uh, with this great job out of college. And my parents thought it was all the money in the world. And so did I. And and I said, you know, I really wonder if I could be good at rowing. And um and I, I got a tryout with the National Team Training Center in Boston and uh, went and I got invited to to come train and join the National Training Center called BRC, Boston Rowing Center. And so then it had to be a decision between this career and, and rowing. And obviously I chose rowing and my parents, you know, they, uh, they didn't talk to me for probably 18 months or two years because they thought I was just throwing my life away. And uh, no one, you know, very few people, I should say, believed in me. And six years later, it was a, you know, it was a whole different ball game, and uh, uh, it was just a, an incredible adventure to get there. And and you know, the moral of the story is that uh, no matter how bad things seem when they happen, that everything seems to happen for a reason. And if you believe the world's a very friendly place, then you know it, it usually works out that way. Right, and I believe you competed right on the international level. That's sort of what I could gather from uh, from your from your information. I did. Uh, it was you know it was a life changing experience for sure. I raced the World Cup mm -hmm. uh, for three years in a row in the single skull. One of the few Americans to ever do that, and I won races you know internationally and um, uh, and and just had this incredible experience that was um oftentimes overshadowed by fear marcus and and a lot of you know i often tell people when i do these keynote speeches or or when i'm uh working with young entrepreneurs that i probably could have been an olympic gold medalist and i probably could have been a billionaire if i didn't make all of my decisions when i was uh in that time in my life out of fear right because it at the end of the day, we we make our decisions one of two ways. We either make them out of fear or we make them out of opportunity. And when we make decisions based on fear, it always leads to regret and shame and failure. If we make decisions based on opportunity, that's where growth and happiness and success come from. And unfortunately, I had all these amazing opportunities, but because of you know what uh, uh, issues that I was dealing with and how I dealt with them, most of the time, I I chose fear. I I chose to to go and you know in in the primitive sense go hide in my cave instead of sort of put myself out there and um, you know and and look for the opportunities and be courageous. Right. I, yeah. I like very. Uh, I like the, the the open sharing here. And then, now tell me then before we move on here, uh, why were you, why did you not make the Olympics? Uh, what was the fear which you're talking about, which maybe stopped you to to get to the Olympics and and win yourself a medal there? Um, maybe. So uh, you know, if if you look at the the time that I was training, Marcus, um, I was. I was always fighting against something because I always thought I was under attack. You know, when when someone, if they weren't, you know, my coach or if they weren't uh, someone that I really knew, if they said something, it was always an attack. It was never something that was trying to help me. And I think it was because I mostly had this victim mindset. You know, I, okay. I felt like um, I was always being attacked. And, and for me, that meant life was happening to me. And and when you're a victim, as you know, Marcus, there's always has to be a villain, right? Mm -hmm. There's always someone who's the bad guy. And then you can't get out of it yourself, so you need a hero. Mm -hmm. And so I was constantly looking for a hero to, to basically, you know, do everything for me. And everyone became a villain, whether it was you know, uh, someone who didn't want to um, train with me or a sponsor that didn't come through or, you know, it was always a villain and I was always looking for a for a hero. And 
you know, I finished second in the Olympic trials in, in 1996 and um, uh, even got the opportunity to potentially be the spare for the Olympic team, mm. which I, I declined again, you know, for probably for the wrong reasons. But I think later in my life, you know, probably after the leukemia and everything else, I started to realize that life can either happen to you or life can happen by you. And right. it's the difference between being the, the victim and being the creator or the author of your life. And, and you know, I, I think that was uh, probably a big part. And then the other thing, which, which has been shown through a lot of neuroscience, is the motivation. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I had a motivation to try and build my own self-esteem. And at the time, I hadn't really spent a lot of time thinking to myself that that my my friends, my coaches, my sponsors, uh, my supporters all had made big sacrifices for me and I should be doing this and I should be giving my best to honor them. And I never had that kind of a motivation and, and my mindset was more about me proving that I'm good enough, proving that I'm strong enough, proving that uh, my life had value. And, and so, because of it, because it was a self-centered motivation, I think that held me back from reaching my true potential as well. Got it. Got it. Really interesting. And I, I like your quote. Uh, I follow Tony Robbins quite a bit, and it almost certain you will, you do, I'm sure as well. And because he used the quote, so I call, it says, uh, "Life happens not happens for you; it happens to you." Right. Um, mm. And and so I think uh, again, it's it's similar what you were saying. Uh, you know, yeah. it's really about what we, how we interpret it and, and then how we deal with it. Now, how did you then go from being a rower um, and, and, you know, being on an inter, let's call it an international tour, you know, somewhat enjoying yourself there, but also maybe as you, as you said, maybe not quite fulfilling your, your full potential there. How did you then turn mm -hmm. into, uh, you know, your first business and, and becoming an entrepreneur? What was the transition there? And, and talk us through that a bit. Well, it was it was interesting, Marcus, because I thought, um, you know, I, I was I was the second in the United States and I was probably 10th in the world at my peak in a sport. And and, you know, I thought, God, if I'm one of the top 10 guys in the world uh, and if I'm one of the best out of 300 million people uh, in the U.S., then I'm going to have self-esteem and I'm going to have courage and I'm going to be the kind of person that, you know, I've always wanted to be. Hmm. And it wasn't the case. And, and so I was strong and confident, um, you know, on the, on the, uh, uh, on the rowing outside. course. Right. Yeah. Uh, on the outside. And, but I was building up sort of this facade and then I thought, okay, well, if I make a lot of money, then I'll have self-esteem and right. then I'll be, then I'll be happy. And so I said, um, no one's going to hire a dumb jock. I'm going to go back to one of the top five business schools in the world. And, mm -hmm. You know, I'm studying my ass off uh, so I get a good enough test score to get into any any school I want. And and I did. And that was a great lesson from rowing and sort of discipline and, and focus. Right. And, and I said, when I got into school, I'm going to make myself a net worth of 40 million dollars by the time I'm 40 years old. So right. 40 like by 40. Time. Yes. So, so 40 by 40 became my mantra. Right. And okay. Uh, sadly, again, similar to the rowing, it came back to fuck everyone else. I've got this. I've got this goal in mind, and this, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get that. Right. And so my motivation wasn't true, and it and it didn't have any altruistic um, foundation to it. And so you know, I I was making decisions continually out of fear. My my um, first job was building data centers for the largest real estate company in the in the world at the time, Tremel Crow. And myself and one other guy who was uh, on the West Coast were responsible for uh, all these great high-tech uh, data centers. We ended up, Crow ended up being building in that tenure about 6 million square feet of data center space hmm. right when the, the dot-com boom was, was peaking. Right. And I said, you know, I, I know this better than anyone, you know, certainly uh, on the East Coast. I'm going to start a company, and really the future is going to be taking people's data, putting it on our servers, and managing all this infrastructure for them. So right. I built the first cloud hosting company called ServerVault, 
Mm. And if I hadn't made the decisions from the venture capitalist I chose to the the board I put together to the uh, you know to the financing strategy, I'd probably have that company, which is worth about three billion dollars today. I'd probably still have a majority share in in that company. And right. uh, if I had if I had the courage to make those decisions out of opportunity, so you know I think if if you look at that transition and and how I was trying to create success, it was all about building this cocoon, building this this shell up that looked bulletproof and that looked strong and that looked courageous. And, you know, really it was it was just hiding shame inside and, right. and hiding the fact that I didn't I never thought I was good enough. Right. How much of it do you do you uh, relate to ego there? Is it was it do you had a big ego which kind of got in the way a lot of things or or not really? You know, I, I think uh, a lot of guys who come from my background, you know, sort of blue collar, first person in your family to, to uh, you know, I was the first person in my family to go to college. Hmm. And uh, Marcus, one of the funniest dichotomies that I had as a, as a young um, executive was the fact was, was fear of failure and fear of success. Right. And, and, It, as fucked up as that sounds, every you know a lot of YPOers think they have fear of failure, which is probably true. And excuse me, some people let it drive them, and and for good reason. Yeah. But not a lot, you know, maybe maybe thirty percent have a fear of success, because in my family, if you were a cop or if you were a priest or if you were a school teacher, then you're doing great. Right. You know, if you're if you're a rich person. Uh, you know, which which meant making more than sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year. Right. <laughs> if you're a, if you're a rich person, then you're going to be an asshole. Right. And uh, you, you must you know, be at, you must be screwing people up and something, right? You're you're not uh, exactly doing, you're not exactly. doing good, so, right? Mm. Yeah, and and so you know, it, it's funny that that you have that sort of oh, you know, look at look at Sweeney, he's off to college now, leaving us here working, you know, yeah. and and it's. Uh, It, it, so I never had, I wouldn't say it was ego in the sense that, that I thought I was better or, or, um, deserved more than anyone else. I think it was just the opposite. Mm. I never thought I was as smart as the rich guys that I saw. I never thought I was as big as the, you know, as the fast guys that I saw. And I was always intimidated by it. Very interesting. And now, before we move on here, uh, tell me a bit more about from the entrepreneurial part, which you went into, where you said, look, you know, I could have made a lot more money probably if I didn't do this or that. Talk us through from the from your entrepreneurial career and experiences, um, which are which would be the parts you would say you you went it went wrong the most, right? You know, and, and maybe but start off with you know what worked. You know, clearly you you sure. were very successful building several businesses and you exited as well. So um, it's not that you didn't make any money here. Um, so tell us a bit about that, but also you know which are which you think were the the parts where you you got it wrong. Yeah, so for sure. So the 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 best thing clearly I did um, was I love the team above everything else. You know, it's it was just like being in a rowing shell. Uh, anyone who was on my team, I wanted to make sure that I was there, uh, just like at practice before them, and I stayed later, and uh, and I felt everybody's pain. So. I never asked anyone on the team to do anything I wouldn't do, you know, and in times in my companies got in financial difficulty, I was the first one to cut my salary. And, uh, um, you know, I was the, I was the first one to be, uh, hammering in nails, you know, when we were expanding new space or whatever. And so the best thing I did was, uh, was hire people a lot smarter than me in their individual disciplines. And then, treat everyone as if they were the CEO. And, and I think, you know, I engendered tremendous loyalty and a great culture of courage where people could tell each other, you know, um, you screwed this up, but that's okay. And, you know, I've invested now, uh, Marcus, in, in about uh, 33 or 34 startups from, from Slack to Boosted Boards to, to um, you know, Unibabble. Right. And uh, uh, some of the some of those 
uh, companies I work with and, you know, I'll, I'll spend time with the CEOs and, and help mentor them along. Mm. And I think there's so many opportunities, particularly in the sports industry. You know, I see such a, a lack of leadership because of ego and because people are afraid to look bad and they go, mm. you know, hide in their office. And that mm. just creates uncertainty for the team. And, and that's what starts to degrade performance, just like you know, any, any sports team. So I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for courageous leadership. What I did poorly was, was make those decisions based on fear. And I'll give you an example in, um, in server vault that the first company, Mm. uh, we did a, a seed round and the company took off and the first round we had, we had a, a hugely competitive bidding process going to fund us. So we were raising, uh, I think, I can't remember exactly what the first round was, maybe $10 million. And um, uh, and we had all these venture capitalists interested. And um, we had we had one of the biggest, most sort of respected venture capitalists on the East Coast give us a term sheet. And the pre-money valuation, you know, was was something like $10 million. Yeah. And they said, you know, we'll we'll give you your $10 million on a $10 million valuation. So we'll take, you know, whatever it ended up being, 49% of the company. Mm. And and this was a, a private equity firm that had been around for um, you know, dozens of years and super reputation, lots of big successes. And then uh a couple of the other venture capitalists came in and this one brand new venture capitalist that I met uh, when I was doing a a charity event, he and I ran into each other and he said, I really want to be in your deal. And he said, "Uh, you never know how the industry is going to shake out. You're, you know, these people take a long time to paper the deals. And, And he really got into my head with fear. Hmm. And he said, I tell you what, I'll wire you a million bucks tomorrow so you guys have time to take your you you have a moment to take your time make a decision and not not worry about losing any of these deals and i jumped at the chance and he did he wired me a million dollars the next day right. uh and now he owned me All right and okay. he gave me a he gave me a term sheet with a let's say you know a 20 million dollar pre-money valuation Mm. So he ended up taking a third of the company, which I thought was spectacular. Mm. What I didn't understand at the time, Marcus, was liquidation preference and participating preferred and yes. uh, quad X and all these terms of the deal. Anti-dilution clauses. <laughs> you had some of that too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all these, all right. these clauses. That, this was a. This was a. Uh, you know, probably a, a fifty million dollar lesson for me. <laughs> mm. Mm. And yes. uh, and I found out, you know, when things got difficult, and and um, I led the team through nine eleven, and I saw all these other companies that were struggling. So I I went on the offensive and and started to acquire companies, and then. You know, the board came in and uh, they ended up firing me and, you know, they didn't fire me. They made me chief strategic officer or something like that. And they started to take our technology away. And all of this happened when I should have been having a blast and, and, you know, we should have been killing it. But it was all because my decisions were based on fear. It was all because I, I had this constant level of cortisol, which is the stress hormone, mm. just eating away at my body and, and driving every decision I made. And and it's incredible, you know, if, when I look back at, at Server Vault versus Odin, uh, the RFID company that had bootstrapped and, you know, sold for millions and millions of dollars. And, and what a difference, you know, that the whole adventure was and and, you know, uh, the mindset and, and how much easier things get when when you have courage and and you choose opportunity yeah uh definitely and and the part i can definitely relate to is when you bring in uh investors um which and and which there there, there can be times where clearly what you're having in mind as an entrepreneur and what an investor has in mind is very different, right? Um, and that, and if that isn't aligned, uh, and that's what I've seen in my own business over the years, which I would similarly say is what cost me millions of dollars, um, then you have this negative energy within the business, right? And you're constantly fighting each other. And 
um, you know, it maybe was different than in your case. It was less by my side about uh, the fear so much, but it was just constantly. I'm also thinking, yeah, maybe my belief was also that uh, you know someone is trying to get me, or someone is always trying to you know, uh, you know, do something which uh, which I don't want, you know, for other reasons um, rather than sometimes feel there's there's certain guidance to it. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, so now, now, obviously, you you exit a couple of those companies. Um, uh, you didn't make some money, but uh, not really an essay at a level where you thought it could be. Um, but you then something happened, I believe, right? And and I I'm not sure exactly the the time uh, when it happened. I I just read about obviously um, your wife was pregnant, um, and uh, and all of a sudden you got uh, you you were diagnosed with leukemia. Um, mm-hmm. where, what time of your, in, in, in your life there, where, which we're talking about right now, when was this? And clearly, you know, what, you know, I'm sure it must have been a huge shock to the system. And how, what happened there? Uh, Marcus, it was, you know, uh, it, it was after I had sold Server Vault, um, you know, I made enough money to, to start another company. And I had gone up to MIT and uh, went to summer school at MIT f- for this new technology called RFID, radio frequency identification. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, you know, was convinced it was going to be the next big thing because Walmart was making all their suppliers use it. The Department of Defense was making their suppliers use it. And every running race and, and cycling race was starting to use it. So I, I said, this is, you know, this is a, a breakthrough industry with no clear leader. So it has all the components of being disintermediated by someone who's really good and, and innovative. And and my things are, you know, innovation. I've got dozens of patents and, and, and I'm really good at sort of piecing technology together. So I thought it was a perfect opportunity. Hired a great team and we started working away. And the whole time, again, I had that fire hose of cortisol just flooding through my body because now that I had started another company and put all my money into it, uh, I was I was terrified that I wasn't going to make payroll, that we'd lose my employees, that this big customer we just won would go away. So I, I still had that stress going through me. Wow. And I dealt with it, Marcus, by drinking. I'd have seven or eight beers every day. I had a I had a fridge, you know, right next to my desk full of Guinness. <laughs> and, right. Okay. And you know, starting about five o'clock, I'd I'd knock down six or seven beers and usually go to a, a networking event or some venture capital event or or something like that. And uh, I'd get home for maybe four or five hours of teeth grinding sleep, and uh, I'd wake up feeling guilty. Um, which is the whole Irish Catholic upbringing. <laughs> so right. went, uh, you know, have to go to the gym to sweat it out. And one morning I, you know, I got to the gym and um, couldn't move my arm. And I thought, well, I must have pulled a tendon or something and just went and did cardio and then went through normal work, you know, started with three cups of coffee and then moved on to four or five Diet Cokes before it got time to to get into the beer. And that was a pretty typical day for me. And, um, okay. You know, and and next, next day I could barely get out of bed and should have gone to the doctor then, but was just too afraid to, too afraid Mm. of what he might tell me. Finally on the third day, I couldn't even get out of bed and couldn't move my arm. And it was red and swollen like a a Christmas stocking. And, uh, Mm. the doctor did a couple of tests and he said, you know, it looks like a staph infection. We see that with guys who go to the gym a lot. And uh, we'll give you some antibiotics and take a take your blood work. The nurse will call you back. And um, that afternoon, the nurse didn't call me back. The the doctor did, and mm. uh, that single phone call changed my entire life. Yeah, and, I can uh, imagine. He said, "You've got no immune system, and we don't know what it is, but we're going to send you to Johns Hopkins." My daughter was a, a year old. My wife was six months pregnant. And after all the tests and evaluations at Hopkins, um, the the doctor came in and he said uh, he said this is a very rare form of leukemia and um, it's it's already moved along fairly aggressively. You should probably put your affairs in order and and say your goodbyes. Wow. And um, and that's you know that Marcus was when uh, I just regret hit me like a like a baseball bat to the stomach. Mm. And I, I look back on my life 
and I realized that, you know, I was afraid of everything. And, and I was, I was hiding in my cave for 35 years because hiding with my shame, right. I never wanted anyone to know I was afraid and I was afraid of rejection and abandonment. And I, most of all, I was terrified of flying, mm. right. I wouldn't, I if I could avoid getting on an airplane at all costs, I would. And it took at least a six pack to drag me onto an airplane. Wow. And, uh, and, and so, you know, I'm in Hopkins and my daughter Shannon is at her grandparents' house and I'm thinking the memory she's going to have of her late father is a guy who's too big of a coward to get on a plane and take her to Disney. And, and that's, you know, that's all I can think about when, when I, when they gave me the diagnosis was that I had just, I had wasted my whole life. Yeah, and, I um, and, and, you know, you'll appreciate the, the irony of, of this part because I, I took it very differently than I would have taken it probably just a week before this. But uh, the second or third week at Hopkins, uh, my wife got an email from my COO, who, uh, you know, at the time we were about 10 employees at Odin, uh, got a, an a email, didn't even, didn't even come in person to her or to me. And, uh, and this is, was one of my friends from business school. And he said, uh, he said, you know, it looks like uh, things aren't going to work out so well. Uh, I've got another opportunity. I'm taking it. Uh, good luck. Right. Yep. <laughs> and he's leaving you there. Right. Yeah. And and so the old me, uh, you know, would have would have absolutely gone batshit crazy, and uh, you know, had a ton to say to him, and and did everything I could to screw him and everything else, but. Sort of the the dying me said, you know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And if I if I get out of here, then you know, I've got a second chance at life. And right. and you know, without without spoiling the story, I did live. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, so you, you lived. That's glad. I'm very happy to hear that part. And and I'd love to hear just a little bit of, of course, you know, for anyone who uh, will ever be diagnosed with this, what did you do? Uh, or what made what helped, what saved your life? Um, was it just you know, medicine or, or mindset or everything in between? I was, it was three things, Marcus. And, um, so, uh, maybe, maybe four things now that I think about it. Uh, I always tell people three things, but I, a fourth just, just came to me that I think was super important. Mm, um, please. so number one, you know, best doctors in the world, no, no doubt about it. Number two, uh, the grace of God, you know, just, uh, said a lot of prayers and, uh, and believe that, the the universe uh was a very friendly place if if you let it be that way and and uh the third thing i did a lot of visualization and mental training at the olympic training center in colorado springs to get fast and mm. i thought well if that could make me fast and it could change my race performance maybe it could save my life so right. i spent every waking moment visualizing these warrior cells coming out of my sternum and going out and and attacking and and just blasting those leukemia cells like it was um yes. you know um uh Minecraft or something or War of Worlds or you know some yep. some yep. video game that I was watching in my mind and uh so I think the visualization helped and then I I had an incredible desire for a second chance and uh and I realized that I had this incredible family And I had such a, a, a great opportunity with the, the team and, and the technology that, that I'd built. And uh, I didn't, I didn't want to let it go to waste again. I, didn't, I, I felt completely cheated, Marcus, mm. that, that I was robbed of my first life because of fear. And I, just, uh, and I was you know, crippled with regret. And so I wanted an, another chance. I wanted to give it a chance to really live. What, 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 how old were you at that time, what, the, the age you? That was uh, 15 years ago, so I was 35. 35, right. Okay, so, yeah, so very young um, and sort of, you know, in a sense, in your prime, um, and you're getting hit with that brick. Wow, um, incredible, and, and really um, uh, so uh, glad you're sharing this with us and, and, and openly, as well as uh, your learnings on that. Uh, so with all those four or five things you were doing, um, you, you made it out, and I'm assuming you are 100% cleared now, or, or how, do you, how does it work with leukemia? Yeah, 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 yeah. everything, you know, I mean, uh, obviously 15 years, no, uh, no worries, and uh, a, lot, a lot different 
lifestyle and mindset. And, um, uh, and it's amazing. You know, the first thing I did when I got out of Hopkins, well, I had to, I was, I was basically like, I've been here in Boston. I was sequestered, um, until my immune system built back up. So I had to stay in my house, uh, you know, couldn't go out, couldn't have friends over or anything like that until my immune system, uh, built back up. Mm. But once it did, uh, the first place I went was Leesburg airport and started taking flying lessons. And, uh, in the first lesson, I think uh, I peed four times before I made it out to the plane. <laughs> but <laughs> on the way out, I was saying to myself, <clears throat> this is going to save my daughter's life. If I, if I have the courage to run into a burning building to save her life, then that's what I'm doing. This is my burning building. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get over this fear of flying. The second, second lesson was even worse because we hit some turbulence going over the mountains, and I think I pooped myself. <laughs> <laughs> just a, just just a little bit. <laughs> right. And uh but but something amazing happened when I when I chose to be courageous and I didn't know how it worked at the time. I do now obviously after 6 years of neuroscience research, but uh when I chose to be courageous, I found that that the fear put me in a much better state and a much more heightened state to learn. It was like everything was in super high definition resolution. I, mm. I remember the smallest details. I was become, I was a much better pilot than other people because I was in this, this fear state and I was learning to use it as fuel. Mm. And an incredible thing happened after, um, you know, probably seven or eight lessons, I absolutely fell in love with flying Marcus. Right. And and once once I got to the other side of that fear, I found my greatest passion. So what was my biggest fear in my life is now my greatest passion. And I got mm. my private license. I got my instrument license. I got my commercial rating. I got a seaplane license. I started traveling the world to see this amazing planet we live on. But that that isn't even close to the most amazing thing. Today I fly a stunt plane and I compete in aerobatics. Oh wow! Right. <laughs> doing you're one of these exactly, Red Bull guys, is it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and doing exactly what would have terrified me 15 years ago just to talk about. So Incredible. it's you know when I tell people all of your dreams are on the other side, side of, of fear. fear yes. That's what I mean by it. You know, you once you get to the other side, you realize everything that you've been missing out on. And, you know, with that, my my business took off. Um, I ended up, you know, uh, expanding, acquiring our biggest competitor who had raised uh, over thirty five million dollars in venture capital. I acquired them for, you know, a, a fraction of of what they raised. And we became the number one in the industry. And I sold that company for millions of dollars and owned most of the company. So, awesome. uh, you know, the courage didn't just go to, to flying and to sports and that sort of thing. It, it went to leadership and business just became easier. I was working less hours. And uh, when I was honest and authentic with my team and I said, you know, uh, when we came back, I said, look, we lost this customer. We lost our COO. We might be fucked. And we might, you know, we might be out of business in two months. Uh, first of all, the look on everyone's face to hear me say anything other than, you know, I've got it, we're under control, don't you worry. I, th I think that, you know, that shocked them and they were, they were wondering who I was. <laughs> right. And then, you know, what happened was, uh, was incredible. Everyone started jumping in with different ideas. Everyone said, you know, here's how we can respond. And it was, it was such a better culture, uh, rather than, you know, me having to shoulder the weight of everything, I felt like, my God, this is a, this is a team that's really willing to, to jump in here and bring a bunch of diversity, a bunch of different approaches and, and real trust and authenticity. And, and we just took off and, yeah. you know, similar to, to other companies that I've led since then, or I've helped, you know, other people leave that I, I can just see the transformation. And, you know, if you look at organizations, I've been talking to some of the U.S. Olympic Committee um, teams and, and governing bodies, and if you look at how some of them are, are being run in this state of fear and, and um, you know, just 
almost a dictatorship where things are coming down on high. You, it's it's no wonder that so many of them are in financial distress and and you know not performing the way we should. And and then you look at other organizations and a, a friend of mine is running the US Cycling Association and they're they're just, you know, they're doing better than they ever have and membership is up and and it all boils down in my mind, Marcus, to to courage versus fear. Yeah. No, I mean I love this. I it almost sounds like you know there's a Patrick Sweeney 2.0 version here, right? You're you're a second chance yeah. in life and, and you obviously grab that uh Uh, in, in, in every conceivable way and became the fear guru on the back of it, um, which is really what I love this, uh, this whole story about how, you know, everything you were doing before and then you have this, this you know, big pivot in moment here. Um, mm -hmm. So talk us about, you know, your 2.0 version here. Um, you obviously, you, you continue to run businesses, but you also really went into other areas, right? And that's where adventure racing comes into place. Uh, you know, you're becoming a you know, public speaker, TED Talks, and, you know, all those sort of things. Uh, talk a bit about that. You know, how, you know, you where, know Mark, that's, where did that lead that's, to? That's, yeah, the, the, and that's the amazing part about when you start making decisions based on courage uh, opportunity, That means every time you feel uncomfortable, you go that way. Instead mm. of turning back and, and going and running in your cave, you know, our, our brain has this mechanism called the amygdala, um, mm. which two million years ago, the caveman ancestors of ours programmed that thing to be an early warning system for danger, right? Mm. So it, it would warn us when a saber-toothed tiger was going to attack. But instead... That, that's, that's wired into our DNA. That handles the fight or flight response. Yes. And when people feel it, our default is to defense, right? We want to run back to the cave and hide. And what I found out from my experience with Hopkins and then the flying experience is when I feel that, <clears throat> excuse me, that same feeling, that, that amygdala trying to, to explode those warning signals, that's when I have an opportunity in front of me. And so when, when people have said, you know, uh, I, I started trying to figure out, you know, if, if the thing that scared me the most in life now turned into my greatest passion, all these other things that always scared me that I'd read about in, in Sports Illustrated or see in the, in the New York Times or what have you, I, you know, those things all scared me even just reading about being on that, that mountain or, or doing that. I said, what if I just do it? Mm -hmm. I wonder what happens if I face those on. And, and you know, I did this, this crazy adventure that turned into a, uh, uh, a series called Sport and Survival for Epic TV, mm -hmm. where uh, I raced the Iditarod Trail, which is the dog sled race in Alaska. A week before the dogs went, they invited 40 adventurers to either do it by bike or by on foot. Mm -hmm. And so I did it by bike. And The first night it was minus 35 degrees and it's all self-supporting and you know uh, you're in the middle of Alaska at some point 300 miles from the from the nearest road mm -hmm. and I was just having a blast and I was you know out with wolves and and bears and you know stars and uh, and and not sleeping and in this crazy race and someone said you know I wonder why no one's biked to the base camp of Mount Everest and you know wouldn't that be a great adventure and And I said, well, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just, and you did. <laughs> because it terrified me. And I did it. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, and the, the same thing with Mount Elbrus and Kilimanjaro. And someone said, you know, no one's ever been up Kilimanjaro. And I said, hell, I'll do it. <laughs> and, wow. and so this crazy adventure life, uh, Marcus, and, you know, not just physical adventures like that. I, I told my wife, you know, we had a horse farm in Virginia and, you know, we had a, We had like sort of the cookie color lifestyle. And I said, well, we have to go to France. I want to I wanna live for a time in, in the most beautiful place in the world. It's this town called Chamonix. Yes. And it's a skiing, mountain biking, paragliding, rock climbing, you know, Mecca. Yes. And, uh, and everyone said, oh, no, you can't do that. You've got kids in school. You've got, you know, this. And I said, fuck it. We're going to do it because right. it scares me. Yes. <laughs> and so... You know that was that was eight years ago, and uh, and you know it's it's been such a great source of joy and the flying and so you know I, I say all this, Marcus, because from all my research and doing the book, 
uh, I wanted to put a handbook together so other people could reprogram their mind without mm. without needing this near death experience, right? And yes. anybody can live an amazing life. Anyone can live this great big, you know, what people think is larger than life if they reprogram their mind. And uh, and that's why I spent six years and three dozen of the world's top neuroscientists distilling it down to how we do that and, and why things work. And, and, you know, that's my goal now is to teach people all over the world to not let fear be used as a tool against them, not let fear hold them back, but rather use it as a fuel for, yeah. for their ultimate performance. Yes, I love that. And, and I mean, you know, in the current environment we're in now here, we're in COVID, um, people are losing their jobs all over the world, companies going bankrupt. I mean, I'm assuming, you know, without having seen actual statistics, it, the fear level is probably higher than maybe it's ever been and or at least, uh, you know, at, at sort of this, you know, peak level. Um, so you must mm -hmm. either get lots of calls um, and or, of course, been really, you must be really busy um, with this, people coming to you and saying, how can you, you know, how can you work with us? So how do you work with uh, companies or with individuals? Um, you know, you train them or, um, you know, how do you, how do you get involved with this? Well, there, there's uh, three ways, Marcus, primarily. Um, first and foremost is, uh, you know, what was keynote speeches, um, but has now uh, been webinars. Right. So I've done, you know, uh, since I've been here in Boston since March, I've done almost 30 webinars for uh, MIT, for Toyota, for University of Virginia, for um, you know tons of YPO companies, mm. and uh, and and that helps a lot. And and you know basically what I'm sharing with people is how the brain works and and what's happening now, and then how we can how we can either limit some of the anxiety or if you know if you're in a good place how we can take advantage of this and and find peak performance now and um uh, so that's sort of the keynote the other is i've, I've got uh, just a handful of ceos that i work with and um you know sort of uh, monthly uh type of Not of uh, engagement and that sort of thing and and uh and then the the last thing, which uh, a couple of companies actually, I start one next week after my my TED talk in DC. Um, I've put together a four part masterclass on uh, peak peak performance post pandemic. So how to use right. fear and, and neuroscience to really accelerate your growth in the new normal. And yes. uh, and that, that that next normal, you know, we've got the old normal, we've got the COVID normal that we're in now. But the next normal is, um, you know, understanding, particularly, you know, from a sales and marketing perspective. And I'm finding this with some of the sports uh, affiliations I've been been talking to a bit that that it's they tend to be reactionary and a lot of companies are waiting to see how things will work out. And those are the companies that are going to end up really getting crushed yeah. right? because if they wait to see how it works out and then they act, it's too late. So Absolutely. it's the companies that are acting now and that are arming themselves with an ability to be creative, to be innovative, to look at the opportunity because there's so many opportunities now. And, right. and the fact that if you're getting laid off now, if, you, if you're like Patrick Sweeney version one, then, then you're depressed and why me? You're having a pity party saying, you know, I did a great job. I shouldn't, I don't deserve to be laid off. If you're Patrick Sweeney version two, then what you're saying is what a, what a kick-ass opportunity I have here. I'm unencumbered. I can do what is right smack dab in the middle of my genius. And I can turn that into my new career and I'm going to design a world for me that's going to put me where I never thought I'd be able to be. And this is such a good opportunity, and I'm so pleased this happened. Yeah. And, and so we can choose version one or version two. Version one is where our, that two million-year-old piece of software in our amygdala, in that fear center, that's where it wants us to go, right? We want to default to defense. And if we do that, then, you know, woe is me, uh, let's break out the bottle, you know, let me start uh, smoking pot again, let me, you know, get back to these bad habits to numb out the terrible situation. Nice. Or you make it, take advantage of this and say, 
There's so many good things happening right now. I'm going to lead this team like they've never been led before. I'm going to, you know, take advantage of this situation and and have the life of my dreams. I love it. I love it. And and uh, and clearly, as you said, you know, studying neuroscience and therefore understanding really, as you keep saying, how the brain works um, and how the brain reacts, uh, I think is is the key to the puzzle here. And and uh, I have lots of friends who are in the similar space as well here in Malaysia, a company called Mind Valley, uh, which really focuses a lot oh, yeah. on those things. Uh, you, you might know these guys. If not, I'll, I'll definitely connect you with them. Um, Uh, you know, what's his name? Vision? Vision yeah, Vision. Yeah, Vision. He's a good friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he lives next to me, next door, basically. <laughs> so, uh, oh, man. Yeah, he's great. I've, I've listened to some of his meditations. He's awesome. Yeah, yeah Vision is a, is a rock star in the same similar space here. Um, yeah. So, uh, look, uh, Patrick, this was an amazing uh, conversation. We could go on forever here. Um, but I just want to do, you know, let's sort of maybe sort of the last sort of messages you have um, for for our listeners here. Um, first of all, you know, wh how can they get in touch with you? Uh, I know you have a website. Uh, maybe if you just uh, um, mention that real quick so that people know where to find you. Sure. Um, it's there's a couple of ways you can find me. PJ Sweeney, like Patrick Joseph, PJ Sweeney dot com or um, fear is fuel dot com for the book. So the book right. is called Fear is right. Fuel, and it's available uh, anywhere books are sold. And um, uh, Instagram is The Fear Guru, and right. Twitter is J. Sweeney. And then uh, LinkedIn, you can look up The Fear Guru as well. So they can, they can find me on uh, any of those spots. That's awesome. And, and uh, yeah, I, like I said, I, I'm going to get a copy too. I haven't had a chance to read the whole book. I've just read sort of uh, pieces what I found online uh, for, you know, in preparation for our call here. Um, but it, that sounds like there would be some amazing things inside. So I'd love uh, to get, get myself a copy from you there. Uh, I, will, I will get you a, a, a signed copy, Marcus. Awesome. I love that. Thank you very much. Um, and it's interesting because uh, Vision was just, uh, I just saw him a few days ago. He, he has a new book out uh, called The Buddha and the Badass. Um, and it, it goes a bit, in, it's a, it's a, and it's actually a business book as well, right? And it's similar talking about, you know, how you have to be a bit of both, right? You have to sort of have that mm -hmm. Buddha ability to be calm and steady. But you also have to be a badass, uh, in, you know, if you want to achieve something and, and you want to change the world. Uh, and I think it's an interesting, you know, analogy there between what both of you guys are doing. I love that. So um, this was was a lot of fun. Um, as I said, do you have any part, final sort of thoughts uh, for for people in currently in this environment? Um, you know, what did, where should what where should they focus on? And as you said, how do they play with their fear um, and turn it around and, and use it as fuel? Marcus, if I had to if I had to leave people with anything. It would be the biggest lesson. So right now, what why people feel anxiety is because that early warning system for danger, the amygdala, that two million year old piece of software running on our primitive brain is freaking out. And it's freaking out because we don't understand what's going on around us. And, right. and that's that uncertainty drives a need to feel safe for in order to feel safe. And, and to get back to a place we like, we run to our cave. So we default to our defense in a situation like that. And that's the worst thing you can do. And that's also why we judge people. It's also the root of intolerance. And one thing that I found out after I got out of Hopkins was the essence of life is uncertainty. Mm. And so if we can't thrive in a moment of uncertainty, then we're going to miss out on the essence of life. So I would tell everyone, as uncomfortable as that feels, once you get used to that feeling of discomfort, and, and it's cliche to say, you know, people have said you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yes. But once you get used to those, those feelings of fear, so, it, you know, if you think about the cave analogy is where you go to feel safe, Really, we want to get to the Garden of Eden, but we've got to cross this wide, vast jungle to do it. And as soon as we step into the jungle, those the fear warning systems start to explode. Right. So we go back right. into the cave. What we have to do is embrace that feeling and know that if we step into the jungle for that long trek, that feeling is going to shift from fear to excitement and love and adventure. 
Mm. And if you trust that will happen, then your entire life will change. Incredible. And I think you are living proof of that um, from how you overcame you know, your illness to, of course, your fear of flying and, and all those other adventures you are now on. Uh, I think it's incredible. So thank you so much for sharing this story with me here this morning. Um, and I can't wait to, uh, you know, have further conversation with you on, on, uh, on your books and all the great things you're doing. Marcus, well, thank you all uh, very much for, for having me. It's a great honor to be on here. And I appreciate everyone who took the time out of their busy day to, to listen. I hope there is something you got here. And please feel free to connect with me. Shoot me, you know, any questions or ideas or anything else you'd like to hear. And uh, I'd love to hear about your journey. Yes, awesome. Definitely. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you, Marcus. The Sports Entrepreneurs by Marcus Lure Podcasts are a collection of interviews and stories. All content in this podcast is the copyright of Marcus Lure. Reproduction and distribution of the presentation without written permission of the owner is prohibited. All rights reserved.